Hello everybody, um, welcome to this evening. This is a very special evening we have with uh, David Hoffmeister and Francis. And I know a lot of people have travelled quite far as well. There's a number of people from Armagh and Dublin and Van Kilty and, and Kerry as well. So I'd like to welcome you all here for this very unique evening. Um, just one thing maybe just to have everyone maybe just to switch your phones off or put them silent just for the, the evening. And they just made it about the story about David. I first um, so I had the pleasure of interviewing David about 12 months ago at this stage and it was very just spontaneous and organic about how it happened. And I thought it was an interview that really touched me as a person who I've said. And just recently, um, David was coming to Cork and he made contact with me and he just said, Would you like to meet up? And I got the inspiration to just ask him. We like to, you know, play the gathering for being in Cork, and I feel sort of, we're very honoured to have both David and Francis here this evening, this afternoon, to share their words of wisdom and insight. So I would like to be, all give them a, a warm round of applause, please. It's just so great to be here. It seems like it's a very spontaneous visit for us and, and to see such a big warm welcome here in Cork, it's just, it's just amazing for us. We are very, very grateful. And uh, I think this afternoon will be very profound because uh, hopefully what our joining and what our dialogue can do can help uh, demystify spirituality. Because I think all of us have, have come through our lives and in various ways we've been touched by, by institutions and by philosophies and religion and spirituality and uh, many of us are even being touched by the new sciences, the quantum physics uh, that's come along and for me it all merges into one experience. So I am, am quite comfortable uh, talking about quantum me mechanics, quantum physics, religion, all types of philosophies, psychologies, spiritualities, movements, avatars, saints, the Bible, uh, atheism. I mean, I, I actually have a wonderful experience with everyone that I meet. And I've been gifted by the Spirit to go and speak in over 40 countries. And uh, I have so much fun with everybody on the airplanes. I was just flying across Europe diagonally from um, Finland over to uh, Barcelona recently, and uh, there was a an electrical engineer from Finland sitting next to me, and we just were jabbering away for two and a half hours <laughs> about all kinds of topics. And uh, for me there's an experience of, of a state of mind that is so spectacular that it doesn't really matter how you get to it. It doesn't matter what avenue you take or what means you use. The most important thing is to come into an experience of, of really grace, of, of going with the flow, of living a life of, of trust. And you, it doesn't even matter what you call it trusting in. Maybe you call it your higher power, or God, or intuition. Maybe you call it, I trust my gut. Uh, it doesn't really matter. The language, the wording doesn't matter. We're here for happiness. We're here for joy. We're here to live a life of peace. These states of mind are natural to us. We were created in peace. We were created in love and happiness and joy. And the struggles and the addictions and the conflicts that we seem to go through is just allowing this unconscious darkness to come up and be released back to the light. So that's really all that's going on here. We're just releasing unconscious darkness to the light. And that's not pretty. It doesn't even feel pretty for, for any of us. We can be honest, you know, it, it's been, in some cases it's felt 
horrific or terrible. It's felt uh, very sad and lonely at times and so forth. But I realized about 30 years ago that, that I think the only purpose I had in my life was to go through a healing. I couldn't make sense much of the world. I would look around the world and say, I, I just don't get it. Uh, there's a lot of things I don't get. And then the more I, I called out for help and healing, then the less and less I got about the world, but the more intuitive I became. So that I could hear inner, inner answers. And I could hear inner guidance. And so for me that was the most important thing, because I feel like we're all going through a healing process and we're all here to help each other. So we're here to support and nurture each other we're here to be buddies for one another along the way. So it started to ignite in me emotionally uh, back probably when I was in my 20s and then uh, probably in the mid 80s I started to feel like a huge acceleration. I call it like an awakening happening in me, just happening very very strong and it started to dismantle my perceptions of everything that I thought I knew about everything. I just became more humble, faster and faster and faster. Then in 1986 I was out at a humanistic psychology conference in Southern California and I came across this book called A Course in Miracles that was channeled from Jesus and it had a text and a workbook and a manual for teachers and all I know is when I opened the book up for the first time I felt like, like experientially like a tsunami of love just hit me. I was just like, what was that? It just literally knocked the breath out of me. It just took the breath out of me. And I remember I, I could barely formulate one question and I, I could barely get it out because the breath was knocked out of me. I just was like, who wrote this book? I got my four words out, <laughs> losing my breath, because I had a feeling that this transmission or this book was not from this planet, not from this solar system, not from this galaxy. This was, was coming from beyond time and space and it was reaching into my heart and it was saying, yeah you, want, you asked for healing, you prayed for some healing, let's get busy. We've got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of darkness to clear out. Not just personally, but it's like a universal human race, you know, it's kind of like a, like a crude planet in, the, in the, all the galaxies. Uh, some of you are familiar with Ramtha, Jay-Z Knight, and uh, I think uh, that 10,000 year old man that channeled through Ramtha referred to Earth as the boonies. We're out in the boonies here in, on planet Earth. In other words, we've got, there's a ways to go. We're still having wars break out and, and viruses and all kinds of skirmishes going on and, and if you read the news, it's, it's more than every other week or more than weekly, it's almost like every day or every other day we are reading about acts of terrorism around the globe. It's quite an interesting time to be alive where, where that's permeating through our, our consciousness on, such, on a daily basis. Uh, most of us in our lifetimes aren't used to that, you know, it's, it's a bit odd. But I think it's a giant wake-up call, so I feel like it's all part of this celestial speed-up that we're here to heal and now it's uh, the, the turning up the burners <laughs> for us, you know. The, the, the water's on the boil <laughs> and we really need to face some things. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to try to put spirituality in the most direct, simple, practical terms. Because our feeling about spirituality is if it's not practical, if it doesn't have a practical impact on your daily life, then it's hardly worth it. You know, that spirituality, whatever principles you find helpful in guiding you towards the light, in opening your heart to love, need to be practiced, need to be put into practice with everything 
that we think and say and do. We can't be making exceptions and putting our spirituality into some kind of theological box where we, on Sunday morning, we, we put on our clothes and we bring it out and we, we try it on for a few hours and we stick it back in the box. It's not going to, we're not going to heal if our spirituality is in a box. We need to come out of the box. We need to come out of all the boxes, whatever boxes we believe are real, and we need to, to transcend our categories, our judgments, our concepts, and move into an actual experience. So we'll be talking about our experiences as well. Yes, hi, my name is Frances. Um, as David just talked about, we actually went, uh, we were in Finland recently doing a week-long retreat. And um, at the beginning of the retreat, everybody who came to the retreat expressed the reason or the intention for them to be there. And pretty much everybody said something very, very similar. They said that they seem to have a pretty okay life. Everything seemed to go on okay. There is no drama, no chaos, and yet they want freedom, and they somehow feel their life is a compromise, and yet they don't even know exactly what they're compromising in daily lives. So, actually, it was in Finland when Mihal called me to talk about this afternoon and possible topic that we can explore together. So I said, what about we explore a life with no compromise? Because um, spirituality can be, like David said, it can be something very high concept, very intellectual. Um, if we just basically explore concepts or ideas, and I I know for myself, I came through or came to spirituality not because of my background, because I grew up as an atheist. I had no interest in anything about oneness or God. I didn't even know it. But it was through this living a day-to-day -day life and realize, you know, this is that I'm dealing with on a daily basis. I was going through a lot of pain and suffering and on this unsatisfaction. And David and I actually talked the other day. He said his wake up call one day was before he came across the Course Miracles, was one day he just paused and asked himself how many of the daily decisions are made based on fear of consequence. And that was a huge recap call. And for me, it was something similar because I realized my life was lived as a fear of consequences, day in and day out. You know, all the decisions that I was making, all the choices that I was making, the relationships that I was maintaining or getting into, you know, most of them are based on fear of consequences, not based on inspiration, not based on love, not based on anything of a higher purpose. So yeah, so that's why we, we thought this is a good topic that we can explore this afternoon because eventually when we know who we are, that is the only compromise, is that we compromise our identity. That is the only compromise. And yet it is so suppressed into the unconscious mind, that is not something that we are aware of every day to say, I, may, I compromise my identity today. That, that is not in our awareness anymore. So in a way that, the way that we practice um, together, as we live together, is to actually look at our daily decisions and how to bring them into the light. So. Yeah, just just in terms of basics, when we talk about a personality self, the personal self that you seem to know every day, the one that you present to the world, or including the one that you, the thoughts you have, your, your doubts, your fears, your emotions, whatever 
patterns and addictions that are part of that personality self. If we look at the word personality, we can go back to the Latin word persona, which means mask. So it's almost like, imagine that there was this place called eternity or heaven or nirvana and then you fell asleep and started dreaming a dream and you came to the land of the masks where it's almost like Halloween except every day is Halloween. <laughs> Here. And we, we have all of our versions of candy too and we play a little trick-or-treat uh, every day with the games that we play. Reciprocity, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. We have reciprocity in our relationships with our, with our boss, our employer, you know. I'll do these things, you pay me this money, you give me some uh, time off, give me some vacation, I'll work so many weeks a year and we'll produce something together and I'll be able to live my life and you live your life. In relationships, it's, you know, there's a bit of, okay, I don't really want to do that, but we'll do it your way today, but tomorrow, we do it my way. You know, it, there's a lot of compromise that goes on even in interpersonal relationships. And it's just been accepted as the norm. Like, oh, yeah, that's how the game is played. You know, and we've been raised with that whole teaching. Nobody can have everything. You can't have it all. Just be content with your lot in life and your little bit. And uh, there's something inside of us that's like, ooh, there's got to be more. There's got to be more than the daily, the daily grind. There has to be more than all these repetitions that we go through. Some of you remember that uh, Beatles song. Du, 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 du. It's just another day. You know, that song is about the monotony of, of what seems to be the human condition. Facing yet another day. Get out of bed, brush your teeth, get a shower, get dressed, and then boom. And then usually in that day you're going to have to deal with a set of problems. Most everyone is in a position where there's a, a set of problems and even if you have a good day and you sail through pretty well and you solve all the problems, then you got to wake up the next day and face the next set. And it's no wonder people from time to time get depressed or they try to distract away from this what they call existentialism, you know, the despair of the human condition, which involves work, which involves pain, suffering, sickness, loss, scarcity, lack, and so on and so on and so on. Well, what I have to say and what we're going to talk about today is living a life of no compromise where moment by moment you follow your intuition. Moment by moment you are in alignment with spirit instead of trying to go <coughs> egoically against spirit. Because all perceived suffering is when the mind, consciously or not, goes, tries to go against the flow, against the divine order, against the harmony and the joy that's our natural birthright as spirit. So, we have taken journeys in which you, you have higher and higher levels of trust. And when I say higher and higher, I mean trusting that you're deciding with Spirit, with God, even around the minute things in life. In other words, there are no small things. We, we also think there's big decisions and small decisions. But our life is a flow of continuous decisions. We're not even aware sometimes that we're making the decisions. Ever have a, a day when you just start crying and you can't think of anything that you're crying about? You really think, I have no reason to be crying like this. But you just have maybe a deep emotion of sadness coming up into awareness. And, and there's, there's a decision going on. Everything is a decision. Now we're learning from A Course in Miracles that our decisions are based on our beliefs. And so we have to get down to our core beliefs. Because if we have a lot of core beliefs and un unconscious assumptions, then it's more like our life as a human being is more like a robot that's just acting out a lot of these decisions, many of which are unconscious. 
So the first thing that I found in my life was, I'm going to have to find a way to bring this unconscious up into awareness. And I'd heard different ways, you know, people use like rebirthing and rolfing and there's all kinds of techniques. Uh, breathe, different breathing techniques, uh, or just living your daily life, <laughs> that actually will bring it up too. In fact, if you really want to bring it up really fast, I, I think a combination of meditation and relationships will bring it <laughs> rocketing into awareness. <laughs> if you have the meditation practice and you're involved in interpersonal relationships, there you go. You can use ayahuasca, you can use other drugs, but I think those are the fastest right there. If you, if you use the combination of silence and relationships, you're going to have so much mirroring going on, that you've got a whole plate full every day and then some. And, and so that's what makes it so difficult when you truly engage on planet Earth. Instead of distracting away with drugs and distractions, when you really say, I'm going to face my feelings, I'm going to be aware, I'm going to be honest with myself, you're really saying to the Spirit, bring it on. Like, let's shift this baby into gear. Enough of first gear, or, or reverse. Some of us feel like we've been in reverse for years. You know? Okay, let's go forward. <laughs> first gear. Okay, let's go higher. You know, we really are, are saying, bring it on. Uh, Dan was part of a, of a retreat that we did. Um, occasionally I just, I decide to do like a, a four week or a six week retreat. So, Dan over here with the striped shirt, he was part of a six week retreat on the island. We, we always do this on an island, so there's really no, no way out. <laughs> uh, and here we are in Ireland. <laughs> So that's good. This, this island can be helpful. We did it in Mallorca. Warm Mediterranean things. And then after six weeks, uh, a lot of stuff gets flushed up because when you're doing a six week retreat, it's more like, you might even say, it's almost like living together in a community because when you start to, you're, you're cooking together, you're taking walks together, you're praying together, you're watching movies together, it's like you're with your family in a six week retreat. It starts to feel like you're, there's a sense of home, a sense of safety, of comfort, which is important actually when we're bringing up this darkness. So that's the direction that we're going to move in today, is we're going to start to look at what Francis was saying, compromises that, that have been out of awareness. <laughs> you have any examples of that? Yeah, because when we talk about compromises, um, you know, a lot of the times it's like, what is truly compromise? What is the compromise that we're talking about? Because the first time I remember, um, I came across a Cross and Miracles and I was very drawn by the book. I was talking about the book in a, in a study group um, every two weeks until someone um, from the community who lived with David at, at the time, and he came to my group and she said, you know, when, when we live together, we live a life of no private thoughts and no people pleasing. And that scared me. When I, listened, when I heard that, I thought, oh no, I, I cannot do that. Like, I can't imagine living a life of no private thoughts and living a life of no people pleasing. I, I couldn't even imagine what it would be like, you know, because without knowing it, the, the daily life in this world was so much built on trying to get external validation and trying to get external approval and trying to keep a separate mask going. You know, and everyday life, everyday decisions is about maintaining that mask and maintaining that kind of, that validation that we seek from different things and different people external to ourselves. So when that true practice got introduced, it was a shock to the ego. It was very, very shocking and scary sounding to the ego. But that was the start of a, a life of practicing, a pra 
you know, practical application of no compromise. Yesterday, um, we were actually in London visiting a friend, and she went through this um, AA program um, for addiction. And she said, you know, it, the most scary thing was when they have to take action. You know, there was a set called Make Amendment with the people that you hurt or um, you attacked in the past. And the most scary thing is to actually take the set to call them. You know, it's easier to say, yeah, I will submit that or surrender or give them over to the spirit I will forgive in my mind. But that's what I have found as well. You know, this spiritual path is not just a work of a mental work. You know, our lives are not separate from our eternal state. That would be a means understanding to think our life is completely separate, that I can live a life without any change and I just do the internal mind work. Because what I have found is that when I commit, when I make a commitment to say I'm going to really make some shift in my mind and how to go about being honest and being authentic with myself, then my life follows. You know, I have to make those kind of decisions. Because of course miracles is very, very practical. It actually laid out 10 characteristics of teacher for God at the back of the book. And the first one is called trust. You know, that is the foundation of all the other characteristics. You have to practice trust every day. And the second one is called honesty. And when we talk about honesty, this is something that we really have to practice. Being honest with ourselves, being honest with our lives, being honest with other people in everything we do. And when, actually, when the book talked about honesty, it's not just saying you have to say what you mean. It actually talk about total consistency what you think and say and do are completely consistent. You actually will not perceive external conflict, conflict if not because you have internal conflict going on. This is how radical where, you know, the practice is going to take us. It's going to take us to this complete consistency in our mind. And our life is actually a, a a platform for our for us to practice to apply these beautiful spiritual principles. You know, this is what we're here for. This is what I myself uh, I actually use in my life for. Every single day, every single thing I say and I think and I do, I will have to watch whether they are consistent or there is any temptation to hide to manipulate, to twist, you know, and that is what we call a practical application. And our, our, our lives cannot be separate from practicing these spiritual principles. So, when we open ourselves to the guidance and we say, okay, whatever it takes, I want to go through the experiences I have to go through to have the healing. What we can say is, is that the mask, the personality self that we thought we were and the, the world that surrounds that personality self is part of a giant mask. You might say the cosmos is part of a cosmic mask that our spiritual reality is being blocked by the cosmic mask. You might say that there, in the Bible we could say there was, there was a veil that was drawn over the face of Christ. There was a veil drawn over love and light. And when you become identified with the veil, you lose awareness of the perfection of that abstract love and light. And everything that's going on every day is helping us. It's actually part of a giant plan where it's all working together for good. Our ego doesn't see it that way. It's, it's going to judge 
against a lot of things during the day, but it's actually all working together to wake us back up to that love and light. And so, the mask will seem to undergo changes as we go through changes in consciousness, because the mask is just reflecting our consciousness. Whatever we believe about ourselves, we see as a motion picture. It's like put into motion in the world. So the world is nothing more than a motion picture of the beliefs in our mind. It's an outward picture of an inward condition. When we're fearful, we see a fearful world. When we feel shame, we see shame. When we are feeling very guilty, we call forth witnesses to guilt. The world is just reflecting back to us our consciousness. And that's good because that we can see that that's our step in empowerment of coming back to choosing again, to making different decisions, to letting go of our egoic separation beliefs and coming back to a unified belief, which we can call forgiveness, or you could call it the unified field if you're talking in quantum physics terms. We can come back to that unity, unified awareness, the Buddhist might say, unified awareness, being mindful. It, it's talked about in different traditions, but it's the same experience. We're cleaning the lens, we're polishing the lens of the mind so that we can perceive the world differently. We want to reach our full potential. We want to come back to the empowered state of mind where we are flowing in that love and flowing in that happiness and joy. And, and that will require, you might say, cleaning the lens and, and being willing to loosen the mask. Now to the ego, this, this is not good. It, it wants a separate sense of self. In fact, it will use relationships to reinforce the separation. That's why the ego uses relationships to maintain conflict, to maintain doubt. You know, we've, we've all had those relationships where there's some kind of a conflict or a grievance starts and then it, it can quickly go into breaking down of communication and then I'm not talking to so and so and then this could even go on for months or years and then people seem to notice that they develop cancer, heart disease, heart attacks, all kinds of things that seem to be in the physical body but it's just a break from source. It's just the ego using the relationships in the body to reflect the separation belief. When we give our relationships over to the spirit, we're basically saying, hey, I need a new configuration here. I need a, a new way of relating. And I want to go into full communication, open communication, honest communication, where I can use the relationships as reflections of my consciousness to wake up. So they suddenly go from being used against us to maintain the hidden unconscious beliefs to being used as mirrors that reflect what we're still holding on to and what we need to let go of. And once you make that switch in your mind of purpose from separation to healing, then you start to develop a gratitude. No matter what's happening, no matter what somebody is acting out in front of you, you start to feel grateful for the opportunity to forgive, for the opportunity to release whatever needs to be released. Whatever attack thoughts, whatever grievances are still buried in there, it's almost like, thank you my brother, thank you my sister for coming into my life and giving me that opportunity. And what it does is it's, it's going to take you beyond the mask, it will take you into states of mind, into mystical experiences of, of transcendence, like the Johnny Depp movie. Some of you might have seen Johnny Depp's movie, Transcendence, a beautiful movie. These experiences show us a glimpse of our reality. It's like we get a little taste of what heaven is like. And once we get a taste, we are on, we're on it, we're in the tractor beam to use a Star Trek metaphor. We're in the tractor beam and we're, we're Scotty, Scotty beam us up, you know, take us back home. Like 
Like the, the movies, you know, The Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. There, there's all these symbols start to come to us in a rapid way. So, as soon as I started, I mean, I had the revelatory experiences where I literally pierced through the veil entirely and I just went right back into the light. And those were like superchargers because with the direct experience of the light, then it, I was more certain than ever about what my life's journey was about. It was about awakening to that light. It was about going beyond the glimpses and coming into a, a stabilized, full experience of the love and the light. And then the symbols in the world started to be reconfigured and rearranged for me. So, like when I was growing up, I had, I had the same kind of dreams and hopes like most human beings have for the future. I had future goals, future ambitions. But the more I worked with the Spirit, I became more and more content of, with the present moment and more willing to let go of thinking I, I could control how the future would go and control the goals that I had in life and peace of mind became the goal. Not achieving this, accomplishing this, accumulating this. We, a lot of us have done that and we still feel a sense of emptiness after we've achieved our egoic personal goals. We still feel an emptiness and we know there has to be more if we achieve it and we still feel empty. So I went through 10 years of university and, and seemed to accomplish things, some, achieve some things and still I knew there was more. Now, all of us were raised with the reflections of the belief in linear time and, and our sciences that we grew up with in our, we read about it, we used our laboratories in school, we learned about science. All of our science was based on Newtonian physics. Some of you know Isaac Newton, linear time, empiricism, the scientific method. What's in the world, we have to measure it and experiment with it and try to deduce what's happening and what deduce our information from the world. Now quantum physics is saying, well, we had it all backwards. The world's just a projection of our consciousness and we need to be exploring our consciousness. We need to go on consciousness odysseys and adventures. We've done, you know, Magellan and we've done Christopher Columbus and now we've even done generations of Star Trek. What are we now on our third or fourth generation of, of Star Trek episodes? We've been exploring the galaxies, going where no man has gone before and we've all collectively been enjoying meeting the Klingons, the Romulans, the Borg, you know, we've done our, our adventures in space even through Star Trek. Now we have to go on the consciousness adventure. What do we know about the cosmos? Well, if you, if you listen to amazing teachers like quantum physics teachers like uh, Brian Greene, they will tell you that the cosmos it may look like it's in motion, it may look very dynamic, but it's actually all just part of a, a script that's over and gone. What do you mean over and gone? That contradicts our human experience that the past is different from the future. Because the past has already happened and the future has not yet come. Even though we've had psychics and some of you might remember Nostradamus, predicting things very accurately centuries before they even happened. How could Nostradamus know in such detail about things that weren't even invented back at his time? He saw flying things in the sky and he described missiles and he described a lot of technological events that were not around at the time he was seeing all these visions because Nostradamus wasn't seeing the future, he was seeing the past. Everything that we think is coming in our lives is part of a prearranged script that actually has already happened. And that contradicts our human experiences big time. You know, if, if our science teachers had told us that, <laughs> we'd say, yeah, why should I study for the exam then? And why should I, why am I here taking all these boring classes 
when I could be out dancing in the, in the grass and hula hooping instead. Hula hooping seems more fun than these scientific experiments. But we are starting to realize now that everything of the cosmos is, is already past. It's, it is over. That's why when you have a deja vu experience, and it's kind of a, a striking experience because you swear you feel like you've seen this before. Like, that's the darnest thing. I've been here before. I, I'm just in this position and you were wearing the same thing. And, and, and that dog was barking. You know, it's like all of a sudden it's like, what is this? Because it contradicts our human experiences. What do you mean we've been here before? You know, that, that contradicts everything. Brian Greene, I think he, he and a lot of other quantum physicists have basically mapped the entire cosmos. And it looks like a loaf of bread. Our entire cosmos looks like a big loaf of bread. And where you perceive you are, let's say we perceive ourselves as in St. Peter's Church, North Main, and we're sitting in, a, in the church in this coordinate, we're in something, we're watching something that's already long since over and we're witnessing it as if it's happening to us right now. And Brian Green would say, well you're just in a coordinate inside the bread. You believe you're living and you believe the bread's still in motion. But they can even go back to the Big Bang. They can see where the Big Bang occurred. That's where the bread, the loaf of bread came from, was from the Big Bang. And then you can go through the whole thing and somewhere in the middle of that loaf of bread is this August day in Cork, <laughs> a time and space, and we are having a quantum experience reliving this day. Now how do we bring that, that, that kind of depth, into practical day-to-day -day living? That's where it gets fun. That's where we start to practice what Einstein was discovering in day-to-day -day life. Einstein was having fun with this. You know, that's why he he would use the same soap to wash his hands and shave with because it was too complicated to have multiple soaps. He didn't have toothpaste. He's like, oh, it's too complicated. He would sometimes forget to wear socks and everything. He was too excited about discovering the relative nature of time and space and how all this relativity really wasn't real. He, here was Einstein years ago calling this cosmos, this world, an optical delusion of consciousness. Isn't that fascinating coming from a scientist? An optical delusion of consciousness. How do we come to that state of mind where we are carefree? I'm not talking about careless, but I mean we're happy-go-lucky, we're carefree, we're light-hearted, we're joyful, we're gleeful like children, you know, excited that we can go through life not feeling like a drain, not feeling like, oh, how do I make it through to the next day and I got to deal with a whole new set of problems, but how can we actually live that state of mind that transcends the loaf of bread? We all know that our life is more than a loaf of bread and, and we all know that where we come from and where we're going is much bigger than anything that we perceive in our little, through our little mask. We know there's something much, much bigger. That's where it gets exciting. That's where every day becomes a lesson in trust, where you're able to loosen from the mask. And when you loosen from the mask, you don't take things so personally. You, again, you're able to maintain a stability and a calmness. You're able to see miracles in daily life, not just a supernatural miracle once in a blue moon or here or there. Uh, right now the Catholic Church has just decided that yes, Mother Teresa deserves to be canonized as a saint. But you have to have verifiable miracles to be canonized by the Catholic Church. I say we're all saints in training. I say we can, we can do this. We can actually go into this state of mind and live this state of mind. And I've seen it over these last 30 years. It's just been shown to me and given to me over and over and over.
that's why, you know, what, what sometimes people ask me, if it is all over and gone, then what is, what that, why does anything matter? Why, what are we doing here? But what matters is, you know, our experience. Because if we still live alive and we have this emotion, we have fear, sometimes we have fear, sometimes we have pain, sometimes we have suffering, you know, this really indicates that we don't really know this, the experience that David just talked about is not in our awareness at all. And on the contrary, what we're living from is a very limited, very limited perspective. And from that very limited delusional perspective, we feel like we're a human being living a life that, have, that has a beginning and has an end. And we have to accomplish things to accumulate and get in order to have a maximum experience as a human being. You know, we completely get lost in what our time in this planet Earth is for and what is going to bring us true satisfaction and happiness is completely lost. So basically, this life becomes a life just it, itself to believe a life that has a beginning and an end and we are just going through experiences after experience itself is a compromise. That belief of what we are and what we're here to do itself is a compromise. So no wonder, you know, when we go about our lives, every decision we make, if it is to just bring some human experience through external forces, then that's just going to be compromised because in the end we actually do not know what we want. And we do not know what's going to bring that to us. So that's why we were saying, you know, there is something that is fundamentally, that's very, very important to us. It's not to just live this repetitive life of trying to accumulate more money in order to have some kind of freedom of this body. You know, you're not just to get a, lot, get a job so that we can pay our bills and then when we retire we have some set of money that we can travel a little bit around the world. And that, that's, that's satisfying, that's it. You know, that's not what we're here for. That's not what we want, truly. So for myself, you know, I, got, I was so lost in this kind of conditioning. I grew up in a very normal family and went through all the educations and, and uh, had a very good career. And even though the experience was an uh, experience of fear, of dissatisfaction, but all the external world was telling me you had a very good life, you actually should be very satisfied because most people don't have what you have. So, you know, it's kind of a com trying to convince myself this is good enough, accept it, accept it. And until one day I just said to myself, actually I have never really been happy in my life. And it was, it was very sad to realize that. And it was very sad I, I, as well, not knowing, you know, the potential and where to go from there. But I think what opened up from that realization and that pause was, you know, this book, A Crossing Miracle, came to my life. But not only that, it was this practical application and a huge support that came to say, you know, you can do this, but you have to be willing to let go of what don't serve you anymore. You can't hold on to the things that brings your pain and suffering and then hope for a different experience. So that's what I did. I actually decided I'm gonna, you know, live a complete different life by following my calling. Because there was a calling that started to, you know, show up in my heart. I didn't really have one before. And I decided to go for that. And I decided to let go of all the things that I built up for a secure life.
And at that point, it was very, very scary because I couldn't just tell the people or my family member in my life that I'm going for my God, uh, for God or I'm going for my colleague, and they would say, oh, good on you, go. They, they said, you're crazy, you're insane. <laughs> And for myself as well, I didn't know where it's going to lead. You know, all the practical questions of what about you? What if you, you got sick? What, what about your security? What about your insurance? You know, who is going to take care of you? What about this? What about that? And I was, that was so fearful to hear that because at the time, that's my own fear. I didn't know how to answer all these questions. But I knew that I couldn't live like that anymore. I couldn't continue on without feeling just dying inside. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna jump. And by starting, I didn't even know, you know, what it meant. But I, at least I can start to live a life of no, pri no private thoughts and no people pleasing. And let's see where it takes. Because whatever David described before, was so far and so vast, it's, it was not my experience, and I did not know a way that can lead to that. And yet, there is a way that can lead to that, and this is not through our you know, conscious planning and conscious control. This way that can lead us to that total freedom of the mind and true freedom is through the following the Holy Spirit, following our inner guide. And this is the commitment and this is the no compromise that we are talking about because every moment we can choose to follow the ego or follow the Holy Spirit. And there is really the only compromise there is in a practical level. Are we in this moment choose to give our mind and our thoughts over to think along with the ego or to allow the spirit to guide us and show us. You know, if we choose to allow the spirit to come and guide us, guide us and show us, we can't help but let go of our egoic thinking. We cannot have two at the same time. We have to only have one. So it is like all or nothing in every moment. And then for myself, I have to say, to just, just to allow myself to start to be open up, to share <coughs> privacy and secrecy in my mind is an essential first step to open my mind to the spirit. Why? Because the reason that I didn't have any connection with the spirit was because of guilt and because of hiding. So there was so much guilt and protection going on. I was completely identified with the ego. I was terrified to allow the Holy Spirit to come in. So I was the one who chose to close down to say, no, no, no. You know, there's so much darkness inside. There's so much attack thoughts in my mind. I cannot even, you know, fathom the possibility of being guided. And so for myself, the very practical application at the beginning was to allow myself to dare to be honest, you know, to myself. But dare to be honest with people around me. You know, I cannot separate these two. I cannot say I'm only going to be honest to myself and not to them because they're, they're not really me. No, that's, that doesn't work. You know, the, the practical comes from allowing myself to start to open up and share what is going on. Why, why does that matter, share what's going on? Because we truly don't have private thoughts. We don't have private thoughts. The reason we think we have private thought is because we're trying to pretend we're separate from everyone else and we are separate individual minds and you are separate into individual mind and we think different thoughts and I can hide from you. And in that way I block this experience of knowing that we are truly connected. 
And yet that is how we grew up with. That's our conditioning. Nobody questioned that we all have separate minds and separate, you know, separate thoughts. So to go against that, to start open up and share that, really brought me an experience I've never experienced before. And that is beyond intellectual understanding. What I experienced by opening up was to realize actually there is no private thoughts. People are thinking the same thoughts. Whatever I think, boom, there is in front of me. And that is very, very powerful. And that is an initial start of this spiritual awakening. You know, we have to allow ourselves to go toward this opening up, this total transparency as an initial step forward toward feeling one and connected with everyone. And eventually, of course, by giving our life over to the spirit every moment of the day, then that is the, the true happiness we can bring into our daily experience. <coughs> Yeah, this is, is really exposing the trick because the ego tried to project a world of externals and then convince us that we should go for those externals. And even people that go through addictions, you know, they'll tell you there's a hole in their soul, there's an emptiness there. They may try to fill it with alcohol, with drugs, with sex, with shopping. There's just, you know, this we could call this whole world Distractionville. And the Bible said, hold no graven images before the Lord thy God. It wasn't talking about golden calves. It was talking about the world of images that tempts us to look for happiness in externals. Not realizing that these are all just thoughts in our mind. And we have to come back to consciousness to have a resolution. So, the Spirit is very gentle, the Spirit will work with you. That's been the fun for me of coming across the Course in 1986. Because really that was like an answer to a prayer was, can you give me something direct? Something very direct. I don't want my spirituality diluted. Give it to me straight. Just give it to me straight. I'll, I'll come, I'll do whatever. I'll give you my heart, I'll give you my life. I'll give you my future, but just give it to me straight. So the Course was like an answer to that prayer. And then, I guess the deepest wish of my heart was, I, okay, it's a book, I want to hear you directly. I want to hear your voice directly. I mean conversationally, not I love you always, even until the end of time. I've heard that. It's in the Bible. I want actual instructions. Where do I go? What do I do? What do I pursue? What do I let go of? And that answer came after like five years of immersing with the Course where, hallelujah, I, could, I was in direct communication with Jesus. Now life would be easy. It's easy when you make contact with yourself. Jesus just being a symbol of representation of the, the Christ that we all are, the I Am Presence. Not someone from 2,000 years ago. Christ, do I have to learn Aramaic? No, it's in English. <laughs> it's like, no, I'll talk, talk to you in English. You, you believe in English? I can work with that. Yeah, but what about my life? What about my career? What about my future? Yes, yes, yes. It's, give it all to me. I'll handle all that. That's, that's what, how it works. You give me all of that, and I'll give you my love in terms of practical daily guidance. Who to call, where to go, what to do, what not to do. Oh, what fun. Life has been fun. I've had really a good run of the last 20, 25 years uh, with Jesus. In, in the sense of, I was told at the end of my, when I was in my ninth, late 20s, I was told I would have no career in this lifetime. Isn't that wonderful? Beautiful. Oh, that's lovely. I'm like, thank God, I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> Practically, you know, money doesn't grow on trees, Jesus. And he's like, yeah, I know you believe that, but stay with me. So that was the fun part because that, 
anybody who's like in their 20s has some career thoughts and they're pretty heavy usually. Like, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? What is my purpose? How am I going to make a living? I don't want to flip burgers uh, for 40 years, you know. That's where we come up with careers because we want better jobs and better jobs with better perks and better wages so we can buy more things and do the things that earthlings do, you know. Accumulate things and sell things and buy things and have fun buying and selling. Well, Jesus is a no-no. It's not going that way at all. You know, I will, he tells you right in the Course, if you will be a miracle worker for me, I will arrange time and space for you. Ooh, that's an adventure. Did our parents ever tell us, don't worry about your grades, don't worry about achieving and accumulating and planning for the future, just follow Jesus and let him arrange time and space for you. Like a good little boy, a good little girl. No, they, they weren't, they didn't know about that. If they'd have known, they probably would have said something, you know, at the dinner table. Don't eat your peas, you're a divine being. <laughs> Report card, I don't care. It's all part of a prearranged plan anyway. You got an A, you got an F. You know, I just said, are you happy? Wouldn't it be great to have just parents every mealtime, are you happy? Are you happy? If you say yes, they go, great. If they say no, they go, how can I help you? How can I join with you? How, what can I offer you? You know, beautiful being of light. How could anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole. You know, how about being sung to at Christmas? Instead of eat your peas at the dinner table and finish, finish your cauliflower or no dessert, they were telling us how loved we are. Well, there is a spirit in us that has always been telling us all our life how loved we are. It's a small, still voice, but the ego is, speaks loudest and the ego speaks first. And the ego is like, like a loaded bunch of crap. It's, it's, it's past conditioning laid on thick and it tells us we're not worthy and it tells us we're not enough. It tells us we're never going to get anything, get anywhere and make anything of itself. And we've all had to face that voice in our mind. It's the voice that, that says, ah, that's why you're sick. Ah, you're going to die anyway. You know, it's, it's a very depressing voice, it's a death wish. And it's very important that we transcend that death wish. In fact, that's the only reason that we're here, is to heal and transcend that death wish. When Jesus said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world, he really meant that. Good cheer, be glad. He had tidings of joy and happiness. That's why the Gospels came to be known as the Good News. You know, if you just read the Old Testament, you might be a little shaken up, like I was. I like the Psalms of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, I like that. That was like poetry to me, but there's some pretty dark stuff in the Old Testament. And the, and the New Testament was more, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. I have overcome the world. Basically, the Holy Spirit is like, is God's representative in our mind. Even when Jesus <coughs> seemed to be crucified, raised from the dead and ascend back to God, He said, I will send you a comforter. Yeah, we, we need a comforter. Yes. The human race is in great need of a comforter. So, for me, the first step was, listen, follow, listen, follow. And all that me listening to Jesus was all about was, was about me building trust, me having experiences that I could trust. That it wasn't governments that were providing for me, and it wasn't parents, and it wasn't jobs, and it wasn't all these things that we think are our source, that provide for us. There is a little small still voice in us, there is a presence of love, that when you say yes to it, it will arrange time and space for you. This holographic universe is just putty in its hands. It will send in people, it will send in books, 
It will send in songs. It will send in hugs. It will send in laughter, relationships. It will come rushing in when you say yes to it. When you make the slightest turn towards this small, still voice and you say, I'm yours, it's like, thank you. Now, I've got something for you and there's going to be miracles. And that's what the last 25 years have been for me, is miracles upon miracles upon miracles. And then, what happens when you start to get soaringly happy, when you really get so happy you can barely, you're like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, you can barely keep, you want to go dancing across the uh, furniture in your living room, or wherever you go, hopping around, because your feet are moving like Fred Astaire's, because you can't really keep them on the earth. What happens when you get happy? Then, then it even gets better, because then you start to be the dreamer of the dream. You know, if some of you know from psychology, they have this thing called lucid dreaming. When you're aware that you're dreaming, isn't that fun? Has anybody had the experience of a lucid dream? Isn't that fun? It could be like a dragon with flames coming out of the nostrils, and you're like, ha 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 ha. You know, there's a part of your mind that's just laughing because the flames can't get you. You're the dreamer. The dragon's in the dream and you're the dreamer. You're invulnerable. Well, that's what, that's the only thing A Course in Miracles is asking you to do, is come in, do the discipline, do the mind training, watch your thoughts, practice forgiveness, hand over those grievances, hand over those dark beliefs, and come into an experience that you're dreaming, you're lucid dreaming this world. It's a very quantum kind of feel. You're like, you're in the field that Rumi talked about. There's a field, I'll meet you there. You're in the field with Rumi. And, and then it's fun. Then the world becomes fun. Then the world becomes your oyster because, because the higher power is arranging time and space. And it does seem more like a, like a happy fairy tale. You know, that's, I've always felt that's what the world becomes, is a happy fairy tale. So once that started happening to me, then I, I had, okay, this is great, what now? It was, I want to use the puppet of David, I want to use the mouth to speak for this state of mind, to speak for this voice. I wanted to speak the practicalities of this. This isn't about some airy-fairy, pie-in-the-sky state of mind, this is about the present moment that's here with us. The presence of love and God is with us right now. I had experiences uh, from years ago, back in the, two, in the 2000s, uh, a friend of ours, Kirsten, came and uh, I got to play marriage. Isn't it fun to play marriage? It's hard to be married uh, in, a, in a contractual way. But what if Jesus came to you and said, hey, I'm going to get you some rings, I'm going to send in a beautiful, lovely lady, and you guys are going to go down to South America as a married couple. You know, it's like a skit. Now, Jesus has his reasons too. Some of you know South America is, what, 95% Catholic. Some of you know about the South American culture. The family is big. It's different having a single man say something than having a man and a woman speaking to you. The spirit uses the symbols to reach the mind that's behind the symbols. And so, uh, we went to get the rings and we went down there and we were used in Argentina and, uh, and Colombia and so on and so forth. And it was very healing. In fact, uh, my friend Kirsten, she kept such good notes about all this that now, what, how many, 10, 12 years later, she's just published a book called I Married a Mystic. <laughs> it's, just, it's just hot off the press now. So for like 20 some chapters you get all the good details of what was going on in that marriage skit. And I'll tell you what was going on, it was a lot of forgiveness. We know that what relationships are really for, they're for forgiveness. You know, we say I love you, but what we really mean is I'm going to hang in there and I'm going to try to forgive all my judgments of you and I hope you'll hang in with me for a period of time and I hope we will be lifted up in, in awareness higher and higher to the light. 
through that. You know, we may say, we may throw the love word around, but that's all, gonna, that's all coming out in the details about diet, about exercise, what does the Holy Spirit use to teach you about finances, about control, about possession, you know, all the basic things of daily life. A marriage is as good a backdrop as anything else to heal. You don't all have to go sit under the Bodhi tree and meditate for 15 hours a day. A marriage will do it to you. That can, <laughs> that'll knock the ego out of you in a, in a pretty quick way. If you hang, if you can even hang in <laughs> with it long enough. After two years, ah, that's enough. Where's the nearest cave? <laughs> I'm, gonna go, I'm shaving my head and I'm gonna become a Buddhist. <laughs> you know, it can scare you, you know, because it's so intense. The emotions are so intense. Another thing was, I always liked music, so a lot of times I will break out into song. I could just sing you all kinds of songs. I think that's maybe going to be my next project from the Holy Spirit, the, the Music Lover's Guide to Enlightenment. We, we can all collaborate on, on a pathway to God through music. Because we know music is pretty powerful. Or uh, reach God through Star Trek. You know, wouldn't that be fun? Uh, those are the kind of things I was getting from Jesus, a, a movie watcher's guide to enlightenment. I've been traveling to 40 some countries talking about this, showing movies in these countries, talking about these same ideas for years and years and years, and first it came out as a book, and then now it's come out as an online uh, movie watcher's guide to enlightenment online. And I've got people all over the world that are using that tool that I had so much fun doing, experiencing, that they're using that as their pathway to God. Imagine using movies just the same as you would use meditation. Using movies the way you would a prayer life. Using movies the way you would use fasting. You know, some, I'm just giving you some traditional means for reaching God. Fasting, meditation, prayer, so forth. If you like movies, oh, this is tailor-made for you. And you can sit back and the Spirit's commentary is so deep and so profound that probably you end up like me, just crying at these movies. Because these movies are just modern day parables that the Spirit can use to wake you up. And maybe it's more enjoyable to do it through movies. Maybe people don't like to sit for 15 hours a day and try to meditate. Maybe they don't like the fasting and this and that. And they say, can you give me something that I can enjoy? that I can relate to, that's the way it has gone for me. That's the very things that I could give myself over to. I was into sports too. I mean, I, I played basketball, I played football, I played tennis, I was into sports. That's what I like about Jesus. He's not like, no more sports ever. Don't ever touch a golf club again. You know, people think that if you open up to God, it's like, Never anymore wine, alcohol, no sports, no exercise. Just sit there and meditate. And forgive. You know, it's, we think it's going to be a nasty road. If we say yes to God, we're going to really get a nasty, we're, going to, we're in for a really difficult experience. It may seem difficult to the ego, but what I found is the spirit uses the, your interests, uses the things that you enjoy to wake you up. So instead of giving up golf, what I did was I would go out and learn to get into that, the zone, get into, use the golf as a meditation. Then I transferred it to other things, baseball, I transferred it to basketball, I transferred it to tennis, I read the, the Zen of tennis, and I had, Jesus had me reading the Zen of tennis and going out, not keeping score, <laughs> uh, 15 love, 30 love, Jesus like, come on, you can cut that out. I want you to go out and use it more as like a, an open-eyed meditation. I want you to go out and get into the joy of, of the present moment through the tennis. You see, so there was an active component. Some of you experienced it maybe through dance, movement. That was my movement, tennis. The Spirit is so practical, the Spirit will use, if you like technology, the Spirit will use your, your desire for technology in ways that you can shine and share and express openly. Like when we go to China, before we went to China, they have these groups, groups over in China 
called QQ Groups, and they, they use it for online communication. Well, as soon as we were over to China two or three times talking about no private thoughts and uh, no people pleasing, oh, the Chinese, they love this, we're using our technology for that. Oh, the boards got lit up and very lively. They weren't hiding anything. But, but when you don't hide these private thoughts, it's really between you and spirit. It's just like when you hold on to judgments and grievances, they're just thoughts, but if you push them down into the unconscious mind, you're just basically saying, I'm guilty. Why would you hide something unless you believe they were true? By exposing them in presence, you know, not just saying everything that comes to your mind, but but by actively learning to expose darkness with a, with a trusted friend. We know how that feels, when you can talk to, take a walk with a trusted friend and unburden yourself, instead of getting hammered, or instead of being told, how dare you say that, or how dare you believe that, our friend, what, they smile at us, and they, they give us a hug and rub us on the back and they go, you're not in your right mind, that's not you. They just, they get a big smile on their face, because why? Because they're a symbol of love and acceptance. They're not gonna, you know, say an unkind thing to us because they're there to love us. They're there to look beyond the thoughts. And every time we do that, we start to feel freer. Ooh, that feels good, I just unburdened myself. Ooh, I need to do this more often. Maybe I need to go for a massage, maybe I need to go out and start doing service and extending love and hugging people. Maybe I need to start communicating with my, my partner in a deeper way, trusting that it's going to be safe, that it's not going to be used against me. We're going against the ego when we start to communicate and open up in a way where we can have safe, loving communication and even expose our darkness. Maybe not with uh, anything like to say, you this, you that, but I'm feeling this, I, I want to share this, you can keep, you can still own it, so to speak, and, and bring it up without putting it out onto somebody else. With the old stuff, you know, the ego stuff. You made me so mad that I, right away your friend <laughs> tenses up. I could feel you were judging me. You know, when we start to put it out as a projection, right away we're blaming and, and they tense right up. But this is more of a way of, of exposing. When I went to China too, the first time I, I started to run these expression sessions over there in a society that was quite systematically repressed. And it was like an explosion of energy. They put me in the middle of the, I do a big circle and they put me in the middle with a chair and then they would one by one come up and tell me their deepest shames, their darkest secrets, the things that they felt so bad about, knowing that I wouldn't judge them. And over the years, people have unburdened themselves during my retreats and gatherings and one-on-ones. They just tell me their deepest, darkest, most shameful, hidden, buried secrets. And before they do, they usually give me one last look in the eye, like, can I really trust you, <laughs> or are you going to lock me up? <laughs> and they give me one last look, and then they see in my eyes that no matter what they're going to tell me, they could even tell me that they're, they could say, I'm a mass murderer and I've killed 25 people and I buried the body and such. I mean, they know that I would not judge them no matter what they tell me, because with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, who knows this is a, a loaf of bread, <laughs> it's already over and done, there's not going to be any judgments. I'm not going to take it personal. And that's why they can unburden themselves. That's why they can tell me whatever they, this guilty secret that they were like sitting on like a time bomb, afraid to do something. I, mean, I met one guy one time, a young man who, his mother kept saying, go talk to David, go take a walk in the forest with David. She knew that he was like, he was really unstable and he was guilty and he had, had really difficult relationships and this and this and this and finally she's like, go, go, 
go out to the forest with David. So out in the forest we go, we're walking out in the forest, and then finally, after about 15-20 minutes of walking in the forest, here it comes, his guilty secret. He, try, he told me he tried to have sex with an animal. And that's what he was sitting on. That's what was ruining all of his relationships with girls, with, with women. He, he couldn't relate because he was sitting on a keg of dynamite that he had this memory that he felt so guilty about that he couldn't share with anybody and it just stifled him. It just absolutely stifled him. The best part of it was me giving him a big long hug and then hearing as the years went by from his mother, oh he's dating now, oh he's got a girlfriend now, oh he's having such a happy life now, isn't that fun? I get to hear all of the after effects of the miracle, of how his life was changed, how he, he took off in a way where he could begin to relate and use relationships like all of us need to use them as mirrors. And that's how we come to healthy relationships, by having open, transparent communication, by building trust, by dropping the mask, by really seeing that there is a deeper intimacy that we all share it's a spiritual intimacy, it's beyond sexual intimacy, it's a spiritual intimacy that we become very still in, that we don't have anything to hide. When we have nothing left to hide, we become very, very still. So maybe we can open it up here, because we, we love these gatherings because we do, they're very interactive and we come and we just give, share what we share, but yeah, we're very interested to hear what's going on, what, what you have going on in your soul, anything that you want to ask, and we would like to, yeah, just address that directly. Yes? Well, you spoke about um, the experience having already happened, of it being fixed. So, where do you stand then on the thinking that um, there's magic in the machine, and that by our choices and decision making and moment by moment, we have the option to create a new future. I could have come today or I could have stayed at home. Um, tomorrow would be different based on that decision. Yeah, I think there is a, a, a whole paradigm that kind of, I would fall, say falls under the you create your own reality thing. And there's many, many teachers and in fact, if you look at books like The Secret, and many, many teachings basically saying you can manifest your reality, I would say, what, what I learned from Jesus was reality is, is divine love and light. So, so the mask is never reality, and, and what we have the ability to create is far beyond perception and far beyond images. But, like I was sharing earlier, everything that we witness in the world is a reflection of our consciousness. And so, when we talk about making choices in the moment, what I've had to do with, is work with Jesus to start to realize that first he had to teach me the power of my thoughts and that the power of my decision <coughs> could seem to have effects and consequences in time and space. And that's where you can call it vision boarding or visualizing a different future, some people say, create a different future from the past. Those are all beautiful stepping stone ideas, but what I, when I worked with Jesus closer and closer, what he started to do was funnel down the power of the mind to basically saying, well, even when you rearrange the time and space, and like change things seemingly in form with your thoughts, you're still attempting to change what has already happened. So you're still believing you can effect a change in the world. And so the teaching was, seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. If you're going for spiritual enlightenment, that will be a step along the way. Because most of us feel like we've been victims, powerless, helpless, you know, we weren't aware of the power of our mind and thoughts. So the first step is, there was bunches of experiences like where I would, like you lived over in China, he had me going into different cultures that I didn't speak the language and dropping me into different countries. I felt like a little bit like James Bond getting dropped 
dropped out of the airplane and landing like, okay, what do I do now? Because I had to learn to trust, like, I'll guide you every step of the way, I'll tell you where to go, who to see, what to do, what to say. So all of that time-space stuff was about learning to listen and follow. Just listen to your intuition and follow. But basically, it would be like thinking we can make an effect in, and change the world would be basically kind of like, Marianne, I think used, Mary Williamson used the analogy of like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. You know, and, and, and you know, we've, most of us have, have watched that movie, you know. We love the music, James Horner and, and, and Kate and Leonardo, you know, we love that movie, uh, Titanic. But it's kind of interesting from that movie because the man who designed the ship, this big steel ship, was on the ship. And you might remember that scene where he was down there and there's parties going on and food and everything. And they got the engineer right there and, and they say, we've hit an iceberg. And he says, how many compartments? Because the ship was built in compartments, so it would stay afloat. He said, how many, how many compartments are filling up with water? And they gave him the answer and he said, we're sunk. See, there's an engineer, you know, he, he knew the script was written. <laughs> he was like, I can tell you where this one's going. Down! <laughs> we're all going down. He, he knew how many compartments were filled up and he knew that the ship could not handle that. And so, well, Jesus kind of knows about our time and spaceship too. And, and it's going down too. <laughs> Some people were concerned about the world and everything. Remember, it's a projection of our mind and our I amness is never going down. Because our I am one with God is, is untouchable. I am one with Spirit. There's where our strength and invulnerability is. But what Jesus was teaching me is, like Francis was saying about keeping it practical, you always have a decision in your mind, but it's, it's between one of two options. And I love it when Jesus Christ starts to get real simple with me and real direct. Because then I'm like, I'm paying attention. So I've got a powerful mind, I have the ability to choose, not in reality, because it's pure oneness, but in the dream state. I have a split mind, and every decision I'm making, every moment of every day, is either between the ego or the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's trying to take me back to heaven, so every decision I make with the Holy Spirit, I feel happy, joyful, peaceful. And every decision I make with the ego is, is part of that death wish. It's still a decision to remain separate. So you see how he's taken all these decisions that we make in a lifetime, which is millions. We make millions of decisions in a human lifetime and he's going, let's cut the chase. You want to be self-realized and enlightened? Yeah. Well you're making a choice between the Holy Spirit and the ego and the purpose that you choose in your mind is so important. He even uses examples in the workbook where he says, uh, when you make a call using a phone, you're trying to reach someone who's not in your proximity. See how he's practical? He's telling it, he gives it to us a human example. When you try to use your phone to reach somebody who's not in your proximity, you know, that's what you think communication is. He says, but, the real question is, what do you want to reach him for? See, that's where Jesus is saying, when you call somebody, what is the purpose of your call? That's good. Am I calling my mother to extend love, or am I calling to complain? Am I calling my boss to extend love, or to try to get out of a day of work? You know, you see the purpose is everything. And he also says in the Course, he says, the only problem you have now is that you still believe that you can run some aspects of your own life apart from God. You like to say, okay, uh, give me some help with my relationships and I've got a sore neck, I can use some help on that. And uh, yeah, it's kind of gray here in Ireland, can I have a, a sunny day? I have a sunny day, and then, um, what about finances? Oh, no. Stay out of my bank account, Jesus. I can, I thank you very much. I got a job, it took me a long time to get it, 
and I'm, I'm doing very well in that area. No, Jesus says, no, the only problem you have is you believe you can run some aspects of time and space by yourself. That Jesus, the Christ, the Holy Spirit wants to guide you with everything. Everything that you experience in time and space can be re rearranged. Perception can be arranged. And that's really what, when we say we want a different future from the past, we're really saying, can you help me with this distorted veil, with this distortions that I'm seeing in the world. I, I want to see with a new vision. Remember Steve Winwood's, Steve Winwood's song, Bring me a higher love, oh. You know, that's what we're asking for. We're just saying, bring me a higher love. And he's saying, I can do that for you if you'll bring all of your thoughts and beliefs to me, I'll bring you a different vision of the world. I'll bring you a clarified, a, a unified, a harmonious perception of the world. If you'll just bring your hidden thoughts and beliefs to me. Open up, take the lid off and start opening up. Now, a lot of us say, we're not even sure there is a Holy Spirit. You know, a lot of us grew up thinking, well, that's that's a nice Christian term, and we're in Ireland, so... The last time I was in Cork, I was not too far from here at a co-op, and it was freezing cold. It looked like a football game, a soccer game, because everybody was sitting in there, and the, their breasts were coming out. We were all huddled around. And as soon as I opened it up to questions like this, some man said, Speak to us of the devil! <laughs> Oh, I love cork. Just, <laughs> nobody's holding back. That's the way I like it. Speak to us of the devil. And I did. I, I, I talked about Satan is not some kind of force. Satan is just this ego that we're, we're feeding, we're giving our mind's energy to this belief in separation. So it's not some kind of a, a guy with a pitchfork living in a bunch of flames, you know. it's. It's this belief that we've given our power, our beauty, beautiful mind over to this crazy belief. So, really, the answer to your question is, is in order to see a different future, which is an, a symbol of seeing a different world, we have to we have to give our heart and soul, our mind over to show me the purpose, show me how to live in alignment with my source, show me how to live this purpose. And, and what's even better is, in The Course in Miracles, he's explicit about it. He will tell you the difference between the ego and the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what you'd expect Jesus to do? Tell you the difference between a lie and the truth? Between something that's harmful and helpful? I don't know about you, if you're going to have a way shower, I want a way shower who's transcended the ego. I want a way shower who's, who is a living Christ presence who can who can interact with with my perception of the world and who I believe I am and show me that I'm much more than this human being that I'm a, I'm a spiritual being I want one that's actually done it you know to show me and to me that we we talk a lot about a course in miracles because it's just the pathway that seems to drop into our laps and as soon as I mean I used to read 20 20 different, have 20 different spiritual books going a week for me, but, but once the Course came into my life in 1986, I, I could easily set down all my other books, my stand of books, even the comic strips, and even, I mean everything, newspapers, magazines, I basically just went, oh, this is too important for me to be dilly-dallying here. I want to know the difference between the ego and the spirit, so I can actively choose, choose the spirit. Yes?
part of my personal experience, even though I have been a speaker of philosophy and truth and wonder all my life, having personal experience really, you know, consolidated my sense of experience, I found in knowing for me that all I can speak is that there is something. Um, so, you know, then this whole question of what is the purpose of the ego, because the ego, you know, seems to, to, to create, you know, such a stark psyche and suffering with humanity, when I know that there is a different way to be, a different energy that is of love and beauty and truth and absolute bliss, and where there is no place, where, 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 where everybody sees and met, there is no need anymore to, to manipulate the other because they are lacking in anything. Everybody feels full. Yeah. So I, 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 I have an awareness of that truth. Um, so I suppose in, in my focus phase, you know, I, I'm trying to understand, is this other, as in this opposite energy that exists, is this a way to for us to stimulate our experiences being a human, you know, to understand actually the, the greatness of what our truth is? I don't know, I, I'd like to ask you that question. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's an excellent question. Uh, you might say some people will have used like for ego, edging God out, like an acronym for edging God out. Uh, you could say that that the ego is a belief, but that in reality or in perfect oneness there are no beliefs. So, so you might say it's kind of a, a figment of imagination. Uh, it's interesting because that's a that's a very important question that I think most everybody comes to. You know, like what is this ego? What what am I dealing with here? And basically, there's a part where this whole Course in Miracle comes and there's like 1200 and some pages and Jesus is speaking in first person about the Apostles and it's just an amazing presence pouring through this whole book. But there's a part of the book called the clarification of terms and basically the question does arise to Jesus like what is this ego? What is the ego? And Jesus says that that the ego will ask many questions that this Course has no answer for. How did the impossible happen? To whom did the impossible happen? And many versions. And he says, there is no answer, like in a conceptual way, but there is an experience. Like, and that's what you're talking about. You've had experiences where you have this knowingness that's with that. And Jesus says, an experience will come that will end your doubting. So we might just say that, the ego is like self-doubt. It's like for not knowing our true I amness and taking on a human identity, a mask, we talked about a persona, is part of this doubt about identity. When really we were created by God to be an eternal being of love and light, this doubt of time and space, this doubt of identity, is what the ego is. Now then he'll go on to say that you can never understand the ego. I love that when, <laughs> when he says that because he says you can forgive it, but you never understand it. And he even when he's talking about the ego, he'll use like ego quote, he puts dynamics, ego dynamics like in psychotherapy or psychoanalysis, you know, we're familiar with ego dynamics. Jesus puts dynamics in quotes because he says, what is like a puff of nothingness? What is a denial of God, or denial of love, cannot really have dynamics. You know, it, it doesn't have a life. He sometimes even uses sentences like he'll say, what is the ego, what the darkness was. Where is the ego? Nothing and nowhere. You know, you see how he's, he's pointing out that you can't really separate from God. You can't do it. It's not, it wasn't part of God's will. Oh, I'm going to create you as a perfect, loving being of light. And, uh, if you want to, you can throw it all away. <laughs> uh, the, even the Garden of Eden, you know, the story in the Bible where Adam and Eve, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like 
the story where there's Adam and Eve and there's paradise and all this beautiful lush and everything and then there's a snake that's there. Some of us who've read the Bible, there's a snake in there in Genesis and then there's a tree. And uh, I was raised Christian so I'm like, hmm, what's this tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Hmm, sounds like duality. Uh, there's paradise and then there's this tree and then, and then God says to Adam and Eve, don't, whatever you do, don't eat from the fruit of that tree over there. Now I don't know about you, but that would tick me off <laughs> if I was in paradise having a great time, you know, just really enjoying paradise and maybe there was a snake there that I was unaware of, but I would still be a little bit ticked off about this tree. Like for example, what is this tree doing in paradise? That might be a question we could ask from Genesis. You know, well, why did you put the tree? Why did you put the You did a great job with paradise, but this damn tree, you could have done, like why would you put a tree? And so, I'm, I'm like everybody else, I'm kind of like, if I'm reading the Course and Jesus says, God didn't put that tree there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's good to know. You see, God is love and love would not put a tempting tree <laughs> in the middle of paradise. That makes sense to us, right? You know, if, if God has anything to do with that damn tree, I'm going to have some issues with God. But if God had nothing to do with the tree of duality, good and evil, you see? So I love that. He's just being really straight. No, God didn't, God could, wouldn't do this. God did not tempt you. You're, and God is not testing you even. God's not testing you, tempting you. God is love, and who you are in reality is love, and this self-doubt that you have. So, in A Course in Miracles, I mean, I look through the whole book and I say, okay, are we going to have a redoing of this tree thing and snake thing? No, there's no tree thing and there's no snake thing in the book. But he does give a, a little tiny version of, of his version of Genesis, and this is what he says. Into eternity where all is one, how he starts the story out. That's a good way to start a story, right? Into eternity where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. That's what he says. Into eternity where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. Now, I had a guy, I was giving a in the United States one time, I was, I was giving a talk and I, I gave that, that line from the Course and this guy just burst into, crept! He started screaming, crept, 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 like he was very angry at, <laughs> at the idea of a creeping idea even, in paradise, you know. So, what I usually do to answer that question about what is the ego is, I talk about the two scribes, or the scribe of the Course and, and her collaborator, they were taking down these notes from Jesus about this book and at some point after they'd taken down the shorthand notes for a number of chapters, they did go to Jesus with your question after they'd taken down so many chapters and they said, Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, can we just ask one tiny question before we continue on with your book? And he's like, sure. How did this happen in the first place, <laughs> you see? Because there's something in our mind that thinks, if everything is so perfect in heaven, how do we end up with, with this world? Like in this world, apples come from apple trees, oranges come from orange trees, and we would think that spirit would come from spirit, so how did we get flesh and disease and sickness and other than that beautiful energy you're describing, that pure, unified, glorious energy. And when what he, his answer was, he said to them, very practical, you can tell by your daily emotions, your daily roller coaster of emotions that you experience, that you believe that it did happen. You believe. You've ever heard of like self-fulfilling prophecy? You believe that it happened. It didn't. He's here to convince us, that's what all divine guidance is, convince us of the truth. But the ego is the belief that the separation actually happened. 
And if you watch very closely with the Course, he'll talk about another idea called atonement, which is really the correction that all Jesus did to resurrect, it wasn't his body resurrecting in a tomb, but all he did to resurrect his soul or bring his mind back to the Divine Mind was he, he accepted the correction that the Holy Spirit offered. And now he's, he's helping us do the same thing. It, isn't that wonderful that the answer to sin is correction? That sin isn't like a black mark on our souls, you know, that we have to pay for for whatever. It's, it's simply an error to be corrected. And he was like, that's why he's called the, the way shower. That's somebody who transcends error is, is one who is a, an excellent teacher, an excellent way shower. Yeah, I suppose, like, I, I do deeply believe in inner alchemy, you know, and I do believe that there is symphony and beauty in everything, and that there is divine symphony in everything. So, like, we as people, we learn a lot from our traumas, you know, and, like, there's a very famous quote from even a guy, Terence McSweeney, it's not those who inflict the most, but those who suffer the most who shall prevail. So we learn and evolve from different traumas, and that, that's what gives us our many different learnings. So even when it comes to the ego, I don't, I, like obviously an ego out of control, yes, problem. But I do think there's a bit of a beauty in it as well, because more often than not, your ego will lead, lie you to troubles, but you will learn from those troubles as well. So you can learn a lot from your ego as well, you know. So it's not, like obviously, <coughs> I, it's like an overactive ego thinking you're better than that. There's nobody better than anybody. But your ego can get you into trouble sometimes, but you learn a lot from those troubles. So I do believe there is a source of knowledge from it as well. To stop, like, I, like, as you said, the correction of the sin is how you evolve. So sometimes, when more often than not, any problems that people face is their ego has gotten into the problems. But they have learned from that problem as well to evolve more. And as we actually evolve as people, like, you know, I suppose on another level too as well, like, um, when it comes to things like with ego, like, I, I definitely don't think I'm better than anybody or anything like that. But I do like to have a clean underpants, like, you know, do, you know, it doesn't mean I'm trying to take over the world, it's just having a bit of, you know, um, just a bit of self, you're looking after yourself, like, so I do think, so I don't, and I, the one thing I worry as well is that you, you have people and they kind of, they're learning about the ego and all that kind of stuff, and you've other people projecting their problems with their egos onto other people and all this kind of stuff, so people believe in many different things and problems with ego. But if you believe that your ego is bad, you're creating an internal conflict within yourself. So you're creating some sort of, a, let's say, a bit of a duality. And I worry, that you, are they creating a bit of a duality then in the outside world? So I believe in looking at the beauty in everything inside you and looking at it from a true inner alchemist perspective. So look at the beauty of everything. The problem is the solution. We learn from our traumas. We learn from all the bad things that happen in the world. So I, I don't see it as that bad, but that's only my personal thing. You can learn a lot from everything. The same way you can learn a lot from sadness, you can learn a lot from, from all of them, from fear, from anger. So that's just my own thing. Yeah. So I do think we can learn a lot from it. Yeah. You know? So I, it's kind of like, that's kind of like the question is, is there something good in the devil or is there something good in Satan? And what we learn from the Course is, is since the Holy Spirit's the answer, the correction, the, the loving light, the, the one that helps us, the helper, the comforter, that the Holy Spirit can use anything that the ego made. So for example, even if it's the whole cosmos is a big bang projection of the ego and it looks like a, like a loaf of bread, not to worry, because the Holy Spirit can use anything the ego made. So when we talk about the ego, it's, it's it's kind of like an iceberg where it's, it's just like the iceberg that the Titanic had. They, they didn't see the, the surface part, but there was a big part underneath and they rammed into that part and it just ripped the side of the whole ship and, and sunk, the ship sunk. The ego is, is unconscious. So what you're talking about is, is this, we all have a desire to see with wholeness, to see the goodness in everything. We, something inside us knows there is a good, there's, there's a good beneath whatever we are seeing and we want to find it. And so that's the way that it's dealt with in the Course. It just basically says, it's just a mis, it's a miscreation or, or a misinterpretation, but those can be corrected. And so in that sense, where you're, what you're talking about, that's kind of the way I've come to see the world is that, that 
everything is working together for the good and absolutely without exception and and that's where we can get into an experience of that, that purifying energy that was just talked about or that love and that light and that becomes the practice to see the good in everything you know so I see where you're going with that uh, does the ego have any goodness in it or whatever Jesus is pretty direct about that he's basically saying that ego is a death wish so so is there anything good about a death wish it's kind of like that old fairy tale does anybody ever remember the fairy tale of the princess and the pea remember that one the pea is underneath all those mattresses and it's amazing that she's so sensitive that even on top of the, all those mattresses she's like hmm something's not quite right but there's so many mattresses that she can't really put a finger on it so to speak but it's down there so it's like that little pea under there that that's the way it is with a death wish so for example um, one of the ways that people sometimes try to deal with a death wish is, is deny it or ignore it or cover it over or distract away from it but uh, the example I use is if somebody came to you and said okay here's a little vial and there's a little this is a vial of, of deadly poison and if you take this poison you will die it's so strong you'll die immediately and you have to take the vial because that's what death wish is it's, it's Freud called it Thanatos you know, death wish so basically the ego is like death is real and you're going to die and that's part of what people call human nature everybody's going to die everybody is going to die not every not the spirit but the body and so and if you could throw if you could do you could do anything you want with the vial of the, the poison but you still have to drink so some clever guy goes okay all right I have to take the poison, okay, it's the death wish, but I can do anything I want with it before I drink it, right? I'm going to mix it with the ocean. I'm going to mix it with the ocean. I'm going to dilute it. It's like throwing this little vial into the ocean. Let it splash around for a while in the ocean, then I'll take a sip from the ocean. That's what time and space is. It's, it's an attempt to dilute the death wish. But I agree that the whole point is to see the goodness. So for me, that's the practice of all authentic spirituality, is to, to see the love in your brother, see the love in your sister, open your heart up to a higher vision, so no matter what they're saying or doing, no matter what, you can find the goodness that's there. Because that goodness is there. And to me, that, that's been the whole point. I, I appreciated with the Master, Jesus, exposing the ego because if it's hidden, how am I going to be healed of it if, if I'm not even aware of it? I'm, I'm glad he, he exposed it. But what he is saying is, ultimately you have to make a choice between the error and the truth, or the error and the correction, and he's helping us zoom in to, to the correction. And to me that's the whole point of spirituality, is to accept the correction. He even comes out and says, you are not responsible for the error, thank God. You are responsible for accepting the correction for the error. Isn't that beautiful? I mean to me that is the lightheartedness of, of what this is all really about. I have to give my mind over to the correction. Yes, it's all about the healing and for me I've enjoyed the, the parable of David, it's almost like it came a point back in when I was in my 20s where I said okay here I give it all to you take my body, take my money, take everything that I have in this world and let it be used for the awakening of humanity I gave away my ambitions too, whatever I, you know when you're a child you have the imagine how your life will go and what you'll do and your desires and I had to give all that so I basically gave it all away and then I said now I'll just take what you give me 
you you arrange the life of David in time and space. It's been a great ride too. Lo yeah, I really have enjoyed it because basically it's been about about see the good in everyone. Everyone you meet has a, has a gift to give you. Find the gift. Uh, everybody is bringing a blessing. Find the blessing with help. You know, there's definitely I needed a lot. Oh, you want me to do what? I don't like to travel. Oh yeah, forty some countries. <laughs> you know, I I like uh, you know I I have certain preferences. That's part of the ego. You prefer life to be a certain way, and then. The presence of, of Christ is saying, no, let all things be exactly as they are. Come to total allowance and total acceptance. Find the good in everything. And it's been a great ride too, I, I have to say. I really have not had a bad day. People say, how's it going uh, in this experience? I have not had a bad day for so long that I don't, can't even remember when that bad day was. It was back there somewhere. In the past, <laughs> but but that's that's what we're entitled to. We're entitled to live a life of happiness and joy. We're, we don't really need to have bad days. We may believe that certain things are good and bad, and then you you know you, the ego would tell you, oh yeah, you're going to have a lot of bad days, and you better get used to it. I don't. I haven't had a bad day. I can't even remember. And I had a friend from Canada one time that she came to one of my gatherings and she said, David said that and I looked him in the eye and he said, I believe him. And then she started to get excited about the possibility of, of giving her life over with such devotion that, that she could come into an experience where she didn't have a bad day. I think it's practical. I mean, it's actually practical to have a happy life. Although this is like the puppet. So the puppet, you know, it's not the puppet having the life, it's it's more, it's far beyond the puppet. David, could you talk a, a little bit please about forgiveness? And especially what you were talking about there about having a wonderful life mm. and just allowing yourself to have that wonderful life but to have the power within you to have unconditional love to be able to forgive people that are toxic in your life, but that you don't want to use your ego and saying, oh, I'm better than them. No, it's not that at all. That's not where I'm coming from. It's just really and truly having a fundamental, unconditional love to forgive them, let them go with love, and as Francis said, not people-pleasing. Because this is what disturbs a lot in, in my own personal life, is allowing people to have that, that control and I know it's me giving my power away, but I do it for peace sometimes. But could you just yeah. talk a little bit about yeah, forgiveness, she, please? She's asking about, about forgiveness, and and I would say, of course, that's what the course is about, and I've written a lot of books, but all of them are, are coming to the, the old way of forgiveness was that people have done us wrong. They've, they've wronged us. They've, they've said or done things. You know, we have the evidence. Sometimes we even got a tape, a, a, a audio recording or a video recording of it. <laughs> or if you watch the news, you know, some of the politicians that are out there. <laughs> oh God! You know, it's like, how, what is forgiveness? Well, the old way of forgiveness was forgiving people for what they did that they shouldn't have done, or for what they didn't do that they should have done. You see, and and what? It never worked. Even the Bible said, "Forgive seventy times seven." I've tried that. That's, I've tried that. It doesn't, I've tried, it's not, it's more than that. So, A Course in Miracles, Jesus is coming along and he's saying, you forgive your brother for what he did not do. Okay. Now, you see how that's, that's where you're coming to the true innocence. Like, whatever toxic friends or toxic people we had in our life, those were toxic thoughts. And, we have to let go of the toxic thoughts. That's what lesson 23 is like. I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. It's, it's, it's quite direct. He's like saying, you got a grievance? Your grievance is hide the light of the world. You are the light of the world, but you're, you're unaware that you're the light of the world when you hold on to grievances. In fact, 
he says that the ego has a plan of salvation. And the ego's plan of salvation is to hold grievances. It's actually a voice in our mind telling us that as long as we hold on to grievances, we'll make it. What kind of voice is that? You know, that's like, yeah right, that's really worked well over all these millennium. Uh, so basically, recently I did, I, I made a book called Quantum Forgiveness. And in it I use, I pulled from different paradigms. I pulled from the teachings of Jesus, the Course in Miracles, movies, and quantum, for, quantum physics. So there's like drawing from all of those. So it's actually inviting the reader to watch these, the Star Trek episode and these movies, and, and go into the experience of innocence. And there's some really good ones in there too. There's one called Mr. Nobody where it's almost like you see all these lifetimes happening simultaneously, but with guidance you can start to realize that, that it was all in the mind. It, it didn't have anything to do with what they said or did, or didn't say or do, there's a misperception. Yes? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, so I, I, I kind of had a similar question to her. Um, I think sometimes I have the intention to forgive somebody, and I do say like the words, like, I forgive you, and sometimes I use the whole hono hono, yes. you know? Yes. Um, and sometimes I feel like things shift, and sometimes I just feel nothing has shifted. So how do you really forgive from a, like a really open-hearted place where you really can shift things? Because it's very painful to, uh, to, to re-experience wounds and relationships that are wounded again and again. And it's, it can be frustrating when you have the intention to forgive and you want to forgive, and you're trying, but it doesn't seem to shift, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. I had somebody ask that question pretty recently, and, and I... I used the example of Dr. Hugh Lin and Ho'oponopono in the answer because people know about the process and, and he would go around, travel around the world and do workshops on practicing Ho'oponopono and the best part of it was is that some people know, you probably know the story of, of him forgiving all of the, the patients in the the center where he worked for the, was the criminally insane, not by doing intakes, not by counseling them, not by even meeting with them. He stayed in his office uh, looking at their charts and forgiving every thought he had about everyone in, in the institution. And then of course they had to shut down the institution. He did it so well that uh, they had to shut the institution down because everybody got set free. And then, as he would travel around to do these uh, different events, he would just wait to get the list of the names of everyone who had registered, and he would spend long periods of time going through the list of everyone who was registered for his seminar, forgiving them before they got there. Don't you love it? <laughs> this is the guy, now there's an example. What dedication! So basically, recently, I, I crisscrossed with him all around the world for, for the, the number of years. There was one point where I met a friend who said, oh yeah, he's living out in California, I think in Encino, this and this, and he's not, doing, he's not doing his workshops anymore, he's not traveling anymore and everything. He's just, he's in his, his residence in deep, deep silence. And I thought, wow, that is spectacular. To here he, he brings his ho pono pono. He extends the gift. He forgives people before they even come and show up. And now he's forgiving all seven billion <laughs> in, in the silence of his own residence. Oh, now it's that dedication to start to realize. Oh, the forgiveness has got to take place in my consciousness because that's where the thoughts are that these seven billion, and some of them can seem to be very toxic. We could say that about Hitler and Mussolini and Osama bin Laden and so on and so forth, but it's just thoughts. As long as we, we aren't at peace with a name or a word or a thought, then we're working on what Jesus called, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. We're all going through that purification. So, I think if you, if you offer it up, like if you say, 
okay, I've, I've tried Ho'oponopono, I've tried, I really have tried to forgive, but, but I still feel the block. That's, that's where you just go to prayer and you really give it up to the Spirit and say, listen, whatever I need to have this healed, if I need to run into this person and meet them, if you want me to write something, if you want me to call them, whatever, you get into that real openness and just say, you make it obvious. And I love that about how, how all the time and space gets orchestrated. You know, there's so many examples of that through history where someone will, will face the abuser or, or go to prison or, or, or face the one that they, the last person on earth that they wanted to face, Spirit will say, no, you can do this. We'll go offer that. Yeah, and also um, because, of course, Miracle actually says that um, everyone, you know, there are only two, um, I don't know the, the word, but it's one is call for love and the second one is expression of love. So everything can be summarized to one of the two. Either a call for love or expression of love. And the answer to either one is love. So it's the same attitude and the same answer we treat whatever that comes at us. And yet, this is, you know, it has to become an experience because I remember when I was reading this and felt the inspiration and in practical application, it would easily become to say, okay, in action or in form, I have to behave a certain way, then it becomes like some kind of people pleasing because I have to be loving and the ego doesn't even know what love is. So to basically say, okay, if everything is a call for love or expression of love and the answer is always love, then you know there is like requirement of me to be loving and yet when the mind is actually not healed, it doesn't really know what loving is, how to be loving. So I found that, you know, to forgive a brother is very much a self-forgiveness. And it's really not different. That's why, you know, we basically use our brothers as a way to practice, to, to purify our heart. It's, you know, we, we look at our judgment toward a brother, and then we bring it back to forgive it. But at the same time, for us to truly develop this attitude, to be able to see, okay, this is a call for love, and to be able to be in that place to offer love back, we have to go through some kind of purification in our own minds to release the attack thoughts in our minds as a dedication in our practice as well. You know, because when the, the, the attack thoughts is there in our mind, it's just purely reflected by the, by the world. And it's kind of a leap, you know, even to say, okay, I don't need to, to look at what's going on in my mind, but I want to be loving. I want to be loving. There is a gap. So in my own practice, I noticed at, at the beginning, there was a lot of exposing going on. You know, the exposing of the attack thoughts, the exposing of the darkness in my own mind is the exposing of the ego. It's not really different. You know, people will start to change. You know, the people who really, you know, bring up all these attack thoughts will start to change as I allow myself to expose. Like you were saying, you, we don't need to judge them as bad. We just need to, you know, give them permission to, to rise up to our awareness. And as we continue with this practice of exposing and allowing and releasing, then I found that I'm more and more in that space of be able to actually see, not just lip service, where I can see people. Any action, you know, if it is not an expression of love, is a call for love. And yesterday we were just talking about this, either one should bring a sense of gratitude because either one will allow the awareness of love to be back to our mind. So we owe a gratitude 
to either action because that will bring the love to our awareness. So if we can see in experience as we keep going, you know, with dedication of this process of releasing and exposing, and we can see our brother is truly a gift, they are here, no matter what they do, they're here to serve a purpose for us to bring love to our awareness. And that is that is why you know we can have gratitude in our heart all the time. So therefore would the ultimate form of forgiveness and love be to send forgiveness and love to your ego? You know, and actually if it doesn't have love, give it love and create a positive ego. Like let's say look at this on a macro scale. You look at prisoners, right? They've done something wrong in society, we put them into prison. And that's the wrong thing. That's you're, we're ignoring them. Get over there. We'll ignore you. But that's only harming their psychology. Everything. We now know with modern science that the, the best thing to do is heal these person, show these people more love. Like they're doing that in parts of the world. They're doing it in. Uh, so they gather. If you do something wrong, you're put in the center, and everyone gathers around you. Oh, I'll send love into you. They actually change the frequency of you. So therefore, if our thoughts create everything, and our ego creates what's wrong. Wouldn't the ultimate form of inner art be then to, to send love and forgiveness to your ego? Send it love if it has none, and actually completely embody the frequency. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the practical application of it is, is so much about exposing the darkness to see the nothingness of it, actually. And love is there. Love is there as we expose. Instead of trying to top it down to say, I'm going to send love to this darkness, you know, the practical application is to allow the, the darkness which we believe in, in our daily experience, to be exposed to the awareness and then watch them to be released. Yeah. It's fear, isn't it? I mean, the ego is usually no fear. Yes. Yeah, so we're understanding that. Yeah. Yeah, the ego is synonymous with the fear. It's kind of interesting too that when Francis was just talking about love and a call for love, that Jesus says in the Course that the Holy Spirit only sees those two orders of thought, that everything is either love or a call for love to the Holy Spirit. And, and then you would answer with love. You would answer a call for love with love, and you would experience love in love. So everything would be love. Now what happens is the ego sponsors and says, no wait a minute, there's a third, you're forgetting Holy Spirit, there's three, not just two. And that third one, the ego says, is attack. And we know, as soon as we perceive an attack, even somebody doesn't smile at us, or they give us a look or something, or, or we see our parking space that we asked for, and then the car pulls right in front of, in front of us, or whatever. But if, if we perceive an attack, then we get defensive. But the Holy Spirit does not perceive attack. So that's what makes that the, the comfort of the vision. That's why we need to join with that presence. So in that sense, it is like you're saying. It's it, love is so important, and and you it's you said it perfectly. Where if we're going to forgive, shouldn't we forgive the ego? Yes, that's the that is the whole point of forgiveness. Is ultimately like you were saying, all love is actually self-love in the ultimate sense because it's it's our true identity is love, and therefore we may seem like we're forgiving another person, but we're really just forgiving the ego when we, when we offer that love. That's all that we're doing. So there's, it, we're not trying to say that the ego is bad or wrong, it's more like we're saying, instead of even trying to understand it, it just needs to be forgiven. And then we feel that love, it's just so strong, that love. So you were saying there, uh, the example of the party space. So we see uh, the ego coming in and doing that to my party space. So then uh, the better thing to do would be just ask Jesus for a party space. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. That's it. That's the whole difference right there. One, where we, where we think we deserve something, and the second is where we say, I need some help, and then there it is. And we just kind of glide right into it. And just on the, I mean, we were talking about the forgiveness. Uh, 
in my own episodes of looking at all my ego stuff and all that, uh, uh, I remember I'm through that that phase of turmoil and madness. And I used to, uh, I began, we were talking about uh, trying to forgive and I remember uh, sitting at a table by night when I couldn't sleep and I had all of those people that were in my head that I was angry with sitting around the table with me. But then uh, I decided one night it just came true to me that I had a sacred heart picture in the kitchen and this little voice said to me, why not put Jesus at the top of the table? And in that moment I had this kind of enlightenment where uh, I saw the threefold flame of the sacred heart, the three lights, the wisdom, the power, and the uh, and, uh, third one is, uh, it's gone now, but it will come again. And uh, I think what, kind of, what came true for me in that moment is what Francis spoke about earlier, was that um, I'm going to have to love myself, and to do that, I'm going to have to open this threefold flame of my own heart. So if I haven't that done, the ego's going to keep me in this space of keeping this heart closed, not sharing the love. And uh, Jesus at the top of the table kind of showed me that, you know? And so I think it's, it's, it's a very valid point, and uh, your heart has to be open to be able to see that. And you first, uh, the ego, in a way, it does help you see that, the ego. Uh, but uh, it, it, the, the other side is, uh, in, in that, situation of madness of seeing that ego the ego will tell you to kill yourself and do yourself in and self-harm and all that other stuff that people go through but uh, at the other side of the ego is the beauty of the parking space again let's get that who took my parking space or let's just ask Jesus for parking space <laughs> yeah but, and the, the, the asking Jesus I just in my own experience it always works every single time it works and that's very convincing that's, that's where, I, I think too, when I think of Jesus, it's the heart of service. Like washing the feet of the apostles. Uh, oh my gosh, now that's a leader. You know, how many politicians are going around washing the, the feet of their constituents, you know? I mean, to me that's an amazing thing. To, it was in a symbol of like bending down and washing the feet. And to me, when we look at all the saints and mystics and avatars, the ones that really touch our hearts are the ones that have these devotional lives of service. They're so humble. I just am, am staggered. That's why when I would read about different ones like St. Francis over here, I, oh my gosh, I was so taken by how humble he was. And, and, and Jesus and the Gospels, how humble. And I feel like if we give our hearts over to that light, that humbleness and that service and devotion, how can I be of help? With everyone, we're thinking that, we're, we're praying that with everyone that we meet, then it, we can't help but feel gratitude. And Jesus even got specific with the scribe of A Course in Miracles. One day he, he told the scribe, he said, I love you. She's like, okay, and he said, and I'm just going to do this one day of your life. But I'm going to, at the end of the day, I'm going to go through and give you pointers. Imagine having Jesus Christ giving you pointers on a day of your life. I'm going to go through the day with you. When you came down, there, you were going to catch a taxi, there was another man there who was going in the same direction. You should have offered him a ride in your taxi. Jesus went through an entire day of Helen Shuckman's the scribe's life with pointers. Starting off with, I love you. Like this is all for instructional purposes. I'm not criticizing your decisions. I'm just going to show you how helpful you can be in the course of one day. Imagine if you did that every day. You know, imagine he's just there to help us in a real practical way. And he did. He, she liked green pantyhose. He, he guided her where to get in New York City green pantyhose. I'm like you. I like. I like clean underwear. I actually, I, I basically, uh, I have to tell you a story. I, before I came over to Europe, I, I packed a small suitcase inside of a larger suitcase because I knew I'd be taking little trips like this. And so I, I packed my underwear 
uh, in the smaller case, and, I packed, and then I did. So then when I was in Barcelona, you know, I just grabbed the smaller case. Well, I didn't really check on the underwear, and they weren't dirty, but they were tight. <laughs> so I came to Cork with a very tight pair of underwear, and I didn't know it till I, I had them on. I was like in a girdle or something. So I had to forgive <laughs> that pair of underwear uh, because I like them comfortable, you know, clean too, if at all possible. But uh, you know, that's, it's every day. You know, it was like, okay, okay, you pack these over there in the United States, but go for the comfortable ones. You don't need to be suffering. You know, that's the kind of attitude we just have to just keep following that connection, that guidance, and then we start to get confidence with it. Like, oh yeah, you're right there with me all along, and it feels like a strong connection the more we practice it and exercise it. Your clean and his clean might become two completely different things. Yes. <laughs> Einstein, Einstein might say that your underwear are very <laughs> relative. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, David, um, is the Course of Miracles so your, your daily practice or your tool for living like this? I mean, or is there, have, you, have, you other, have you other practices that you do? <coughs> so all this talk is easier said than done. You have a practical. Yeah, I started, I started reading the course in 86 and then um, at some point, yeah, I, I, even the course says um, at one point, lesson 189, he's got a paragraph, forget this world, forget this course, and come with holy empty hands unto your God. You know, he's like, he's begging, he's like saying, can we not just have a connection here and go beyond the words and beyond the book? So actually I carried it around, 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 wherever I I wore the cover, the gold letters off of it, this, this, but that was, yeah, a number of years ago. I, no, I don't, I don't have a practice actually anymore. It's, it's just a state of mind. So, so I do nothing kind of in a, in a repetitive practice way. I did, I, the workbook lessons, you know, there's instructions, don't do more than one lesson a day, and as best as you can, you know, try not to make exceptions to the lesson, because that's the ego. And, um, no, I don't, I don't have a spiritual practice. In fact, that, to me, that's what I, I talk about, that, that it's a state of mind. And in that state of mind, you know, it's, it's not like I go back to the book. There may be like, for, there was a number of years where um, I would, there was, four particular workbook lessons that were so helpful for me that they were in my mind, memorized. And it was five, six, seven, eight. Those four. I'm never upset for the reason I think. See how helpful <laughs> that is. If you've, if you've tossed the book, <laughs> five, six, seven, eight, I'm never upset for the reason I think. I'm upset because I see something that's not there. Ooh, it sounds a little bit like hallucinating there going on. Uh, I see only the past, which we talked about. You know, oh, I'm, I'm seeing only the past. My mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. So I would use five, six, seven, eight when I had like some discomfort, when I was feeling fatigued, when I was feeling ill at ease, you know, feeling off in some way. I would go, I'm, I'm not upset for the reason I think. Because the ego will always try to put it out on time and space, like, oh, you have food poisoning, or you only had three hours of sleep, or you, you know, it always is going to come in with its story. The reason why you don't feel good. It's got a whole story built in there. And then five, six, seven, eight, we're just saying, no, no, let's forget about that story. <laughs> Here. So, it was practicing kind of internally. But I would say too that the whole point of A Course in Miracles is not to be a lifelong Course in Miracles student or, or teacher. It's just to get in touch with your internal teacher, your internal guide. And then once you establish that connection, then basically that's it. Then the book has done its job. It's like those Dixie Cups. Remember those little paper cups? I don't know if you have them over here, but we have these things called Dixie Cup. Like a little dispenser of cups. And once you get your drink, you don't keep the cup, you throw it away. Now we, should, we talk about recycling, but we, <laughs> we were taught, just take your drink and then throw it away. 
it's kind of like with our practices and our books, at some point when we get intuitive, we get back with that intuitive voice, then it served its, its purpose, you know? We can say, okay, thank you, book, but I'm not going to go around and, you know, I don't worship the book or, you know, you know when it's time to let it go. Yeah, that's, that's where it's pointing. I did get to see a beautiful movie about the, the Dalai Lama recently, where this group of progressive thinkers, sociobiologists and quantum physics and all of these progressive thinkers from the United States, took a big trip over to India to go visit Dalai Lama at his house. And then they got to India, then they had to take this long, was it 12 hour bus ride or something, got sick, uh, we're, we're tired and all this. All the progressive thinkers were getting put through the the wind, the windmill of the grind of the mind. By the time they got there, they they started to try to talk. The progressive thinkers were going to talk amongst themselves. They were arguing, <laughs> sniping each other. You know, it's the ego was coming up big time. And then Dalai Lama, they're ha ha ha. You know, he's just <laughs> smiling, and they're like. Uh, you know, <laughs> now they've got, now they're in Dalai Lama's house after this voyage all the way across the ocean and the 12-hour bus ride. It was a really good uh, movie about how the depth of the presence is just, yeah, beautiful, pure kindness, gentleness, love and joy, and then, and then trust the process that everything that needs to come up will. I saw a hand back there at the back. Well, the best way to ignore it is to, is to expose it. So, so, for example, it's like when people say, let sleeping dogs lie. You know, if, if there's something that is even annoying you or irritating you or whatever, then don't miss that opportunity. You know, don't think, oh well, it's not so bad. At least I'm not raging. <laughs> I'm just annoyed. Don't. Don't listen to that voice that tries to make a hierarchy of, of upsets. Just use everything. And then when you do, it's kind of like instead of sweeping the dirt under the rug and having lumps in the rug, you know, you, you get the sweeper and the vacuum out and you start to love yourself by caring for your state of mind so that even if you're a little annoyed or irritated, that you take the time to, to forgive. That's probably the best way. We've got one right here. Hi, I just wanted to ask you, I don't know if this question has been asked to you before, but in the language of the Course of Miracles, it's profoundly masculine. The gender is never referring to the feminine or to female. Even I noticed when Frances was speaking earlier, she referred to um, forgiving her brother. Yes. Um, and, you know, I've looked through the Course and there is not one single reference to the feminine aspect, if, if, so to speak. Yes. So it's very good. Yeah, it's another very good question. Um, yeah, the, the Course came, I think, not only did the Course come first as an answer to the scribe, Helen Schuckman and Bill, who were having trouble as research psychologists in their daily life at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, but, but I, I actually feel that the, the Course came as a correction for the patriarchal system throughout all of history. Like, for example, Christianity, it, there's, it's so patriarchal uh, when you look at it. So, so I could see that Jesus was making a higher correction, like, here, come to me for the correction in your mind. But I'm even going to use language, I'm going to use the masculine pronouns to undo the the patriarchal system. And, and to me, Helen Schuckman was, was a woman and she was the, the scribe, she's the one who took it down in shorthand. She actually, uh, after she had scribed the, the text, the workbook, the manual for teachers, the whole 100 and, 1200 and some pages, there was a pause there for a while. And then um, her friend Ken Wapnick uh, came to her and said, uh, 
she kept talking about prayer, and Jesus is really helpful with prayer. She, he gets me green pantyhose, and he gets me the kind of coat, the winter coat that I want. And Ken said, I think there's a little more to prayer than him getting you pantyhose and, <laughs> and coats and everything. Maybe we should ask Jesus. So they asked Jesus, can you tell us more about prayer? So then she started taking down from him, and here he comes, because that was one of her questions, like there's no feminine pronouns in the book. Here he comes with sister, her, he, he actually used those, the feminine pronouns, just to show that the form didn't matter. I think what he was doing was, he was using uh, the, basically religion, Christianity, he was using psychology, and he was using education. Most of his terms are drawn from those three. He's also using Shakespearean blank verse. She loved Shakespeare, so he did verse after verse, line after line in, in Shakespearean blank verse. And, uh, and I have been asked that question a number of times, um, many times around the world, and, and I think he was making a statement that uh, spirituality is, should not be tied in to the one gender or the other. So he's correcting it in the same form that it, that it kind of went awry. <laughs> you know, the ego kind of really turned it into very patriarchal uh, teaching, and this was like his correction. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That's a good question. Yes. How would I distinguish my Holy Spirit when my spirit talks or my ego talks? How would you distinguish? Well. We know from the Bible, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Judge not, lest you be judged. He's got a very interesting line in A Course in Miracles, where he starts out this sentence, the one right use of judgment. When Jesus Christ starts out a sentence with the one right use of judgment, that's got my attention, because I know he's all about non-judgment. But he says, the one right use of judgment is how do you feel? Now, that's, he's being as direct and as simple as he can by saying that your feelings are your, like your barometer. They're like your, your thermostat for, for whether you're following the, the spirit or the, or the ego. But remember also, the ego is so ingenious and tricky that it's made up a lot of emotions to make it complicated. So, you know, sometimes when you feel embarrassed, you know, you know how embarrassment feels, that's a form of fear. But it, it's a very different form of, of fear than rage or, you know, guilt or shame. You see how the ego, and the other thing I would say is the ego made up pleasure. So, in the Course in Miracles, Jesus says, all real pleasure comes from doing God's will. Which means you really got to do a lot of tuning in. But pain and pleasure are both inventions of the ego. Both reinforce the body is real. Think about it. When you're having an orgasm, are you thinking of God? <laughs> and the flip side is, when you have a migraine headache, are you thinking <laughs> all glory to God? Pain and pleasure are part of a, a very tricky deception that actually uh, Jesus says, um, you, you have to go to so depths of miracle working and get so into the joy of being used in the miracle that you actually transcend the pain and the pleasure. So that's the simple answer. That's the short answer. Yeah. Oh, we're, I see some. One more question. Here we go. Physically treated your body badly, yeah, and they're like, you know, is there a level of, can anything be, feel 
Yes. Yes, that's a very, very good question. We could probably could spend a week on that question. And, and, and sometimes we spend six weeks talking about that. And a woman came to one of our six weeks retreats, diagnosed with cancer, and she left in total remission. Um, so it's something even like cancer or whatever. Basically, yes, everything in, in, that seems to be in the physical world is a reflection of consciousness. And so there is no symptom that, or no pain, no suffering that cannot be removed from the miracle. That's what Jesus was really demonstrating when he healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out demons, didn't matter whether it was leprosy, you know, or um, Lazarus was not only dead, but the body was, he was in his grave clothes, he was in the, in the tomb for three days, smelly body, Jesus rolled the stone away, you know, he was just demonstrating that there's no order of difficulty in miracles. It transcends everything of what we call the physical realm, and as you go deeper into miracles, you start to realize that's a huge realization that that there is not really a physical level and a mental level, that, that this entire world is mental. Sometimes people use that as an insult, like, oh, she's mental, he's <laughs> mental. You can say, yeah, I am mental, and I'm really working on my mental, <laughs> to clear out my mental from these uh, judgments and grievances. So it seems like there's a projected world, and it's an outer world and an inner experience, but actually the more you do the workbook lessons of the Course, you start to feel it's all unified, like everything. The black holes are, are in mind, the, the quasars, the things that we think of as distant galaxies are all in mind, and, and this is just a world of ideas. But that takes a lot of practice. You know, you're not asked to do that at the beginning, you're asked to just practice your daily lesson with the people in your life, and it may be meeting somebody who has, who has symptoms, you know, or having symptoms that seem to be in the body, but there's, a, you probably have heard of Louise Hay, yes. You Can Heal Your Life. Jesus really, at one of his little pamphlets, he almost was like speaking right, right to Louise. He was saying basically, yes, a careful tracing back of a symptom to the unforgiveness in the mind uh, can still brings you to the point where you have to forgive. In other words, even if you went, okay, I, I'm sore back and I'm concerned about money issues and support, like Louise says, still he's, he's working at the level of mind to forgive the thought of lack or whatever. And so even the tracing back can, can be a step, but ultimately we have to go even deeper. We have to be willing to let go of, of a, what we're thinking and believing. Okay, we did it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to say thank everyone for coming, coming out, and especially to, to David and Francis for giving us the honor of their presence here in court. Thanks so much.